America Looks Abroad. This is the 42nd in a series of broadcasts presented by the staff members of the Foreign Policy Association. Today's subject is America Weighs Her Course. The speaker is Mr. William T. Stone, Vice President and Washington Representative of the Foreign Policy Association. Mr. Stone. Good afternoon. It must be apparent by now that the hour of crisis is at hand. In Europe, the great test of strength has begun as the Battle of Britain enters its decisive stage. Nazi Germany is massing troops and ships and barges and tanks along the coast from Norway to southern France, while across the channel an army of two million men stands ready to defend Britain's shores. In the Mediterranean, Italy is launching a campaign against Egypt and the Suez Canal, the most vital spots in Britain's African empire and the key to control of the Near East. In the Far East, the struggle is also entering a critical period. Japan is pressing her demands upon the harassed government of French Indochina, with the double aim of launching a new spearhead of attack on China to the north and finding a foothold from which to press south towards the Dutch East Indies, the rich prize of southeastern Asia. Today, most Americans know only too well that they cannot be indifferent to the outcome of this gigantic conflict. We are no longer passive or unconcerned as we were only a few months ago. On Saturday, Congress sent to the White House the first peacetime conscription bill in the history of this nation. During the last 90 days since the fall of France, Congress has authorized or appropriated over $10 billion for our own national defense. And this is more than we spent during the entire first year of American participation in the World War. Since repeal of the arms embargo last November, we have shipped hundreds of airplanes and tons of war materials, first to the Allies and then to Britain alone. Two weeks ago, without asking the consent of Congress, President Roosevelt announced his sensational bargain with Great Britain, under which we secured the right to lease naval and air bases from Newfoundland to the coast of South America in exchange for 50 American destroyers. Military conversations with Canada are proceeding in Washington and Ottawa, and diplomatic conversations with Australia are taking place at the State Department. As the hour of decision strikes, many grave questions are being asked here in Washington as well as across the country. What does this new phase of the wars in Europe and Asia portend for America? What will be the effect of the far-reaching decisions we have already made? Is the naval base bargain with Great Britain really an unwritten alliance, as some people say? Or will it keep war further from our shores? These questions cannot be answered glibly or easily. No one is wise enough to foresee the future course of events or to prophesy the final outcome. But the first year of totalitarian war has taught us certain lessons which may have a bearing on its future course and on our own policy. In the first place, we have learned the meaning of total war, war which harnesses the entire resources of the nation human as well as physical, for one end, victory. Half measures or limited intervention or passive resistance have proved ineffective against such totalitarian effort. In the second place, it is apparent that this conflict is more than a war between nations. In many respects, it is a revolutionary conflict or a civil war. The fall of France was due in large part to Germany's tremendous superiority in air power, mechanized equipment and organization but it was also the result of internal weaknesses and political and social divisions in France itself. We know now that ideas and ideologies are also weapons. We know that the French system of passive defense was totally inadequate against the offensive strategy and aggressive psychology employed by the Nazis. On the military side, air power has not yet demonstrated its superiority over sea power or shown that it is capable of striking a knockout blow. But it has proved its terrible effectiveness when used with ground forces and mechanized units. And it has shown its ability to hamper or disrupt naval operations in narrow waters. Those responsible for American foreign policy are compelled to weigh these and many other basic factors in the present hour of crisis. They are compelled to make short-term decisions which are forced by the immediate emergency but they are also required to measure the long-term consequences of these emergency steps. 
This means that we as a nation must formulate policies looking beyond the immediate crisis towards the situation we may have to face when the present stage has passed. In the long run, and in the short run too, our action may be based on a clear conception of our own vital interests, on the preservation of our freedom of action, our democratic institutions, and our future. Today, the overwhelming majority of the American people believe that a victory of the totalitarian powers would constitute a dangerous challenge to our interests and to our future. We are arming against just such a challenge, and we are laying economic as well as military plans for defense of the Western Hemisphere. But the critical question is where and how we can best defend our interests. Can we defend them best on our own borders, or by trying to make the entire Western Hemisphere impregnable, or by carrying the fight far from our shores in an effort to defeat Germany in Europe? Up until now, it has been possible to aid Britain by measures short of war, without committing the United States to direct military intervention. The amendment of the Neutrality Act last November has already made this country a great overseas arsenal for the Allies. The 50 destroyers are on their way to Britain, and they may be a factor in the outcome of the present struggle. But they are not likely to be decisive in themselves. And many Americans are now saying that it would be better for the United States to go to war at once, rather than to face the kind of a world which would follow a Nazi victory. Groups of our citizens are urging us to stop Hitler now by an immediate declaration of war. Impressive arguments are advanced for and against this course. It is said that only by throwing our whole weight into the struggle can we be sure of avoiding the dangers of a German victory. Advocates of this force, of course, insist that our entry would have a tremendous moral effect on the British people and would prove a serious threat to the morale of Germany. On the other hand, it is pointed out by many military experts that the United States is not yet in a position to intervene decisively in the present military situation. We might use our fleet to support the British blockade of Europe, but our regular army and our National Guard are not yet adequate even for continental defense, much less to engage in military operations in Europe. Even if Britain is able to hold out, however, the fact remains that she has no base anywhere on the continent from which to defeat the great land forces of Germany in Europe. Should Hitler fail in his attack on the British Isles, and should Britain withstand the prolonged bombardment from the air, the war may enter a period of stalemate. It would then become a war of attrition, with British sea power pitted against German land and air supremacy. Such a stalemate might last until one side or the other had collapsed from sheer exhaustion. Many observers believe that it would be accompanied by famine and economic and financial chaos. Should this come to pass, it is possible that Soviet Russia might assume a more active role and again enter the Western Europe at the moment of collapse. Such a stalemate, if it should develop, might again raise the question of a negotiated peace as the only way to avoid complete destruction of Europe. If the United States were already in the war, we might be committed to a long military campaign in Europe. If we were not, we might have a choice between continuing the struggle from the Western Hemisphere or assuming the role of mediator in Europe. There is little talk of mediation in Washington today, and the opportunity may never present itself. But it might arise if and when the German people should become convinced that they had no chance of victory and that nothing but ruin lay ahead. From the viewpoint of this country, however, it should be pointed out that any settlement would have to be negotiated with someone other than Hitler and the present Nazi regime, perhaps with the German army. In any case, however, we would still face the problem of how to build a united Europe under a political and economic organization capable of preserving lasting peace. These speculations may seem very remote today, and they have, in fact, little to do with recent steps in American foreign policy. The destroyer naval base deal was designed to accomplish two immediate objects, to give direct aid to Britain in her hour of greatest need and to strengthen the defenses of the Western Hemisphere. No one who has grasped the full meaning of this history-making bargain, however, will believe that it can be limited to these two immediate goals. Already there are indications that it may extend to the Far East. 
Perhaps it is too soon to announce a return to a stronger American policy in the Pacific, for Washington may be compelled to move cautiously in the Far East, as long as the outcome in Britain remains in doubt. Nevertheless, the warning to Japan issued by Secretary Hull a few days ago, on September 4th, sounds a new note of firmness. This warning, you remember, followed a series of unconfirmed reports that Japan had delivered an ultimatum to the government of French Indochina, demanding the right to transport Japanese troops over the French-owned railway, which runs from Haipong to the Chinese border. If Japan should succeed in this effort, either by force or through an agreement with the local French authorities, she would be in a position to strike a dangerous blow at the armies of General Chiang Kai-shek in the province of Yunnan in China. She would also be in a better position to carry out her dreams of conquest in southeastern Asia. Now, Mr. Hall's statement of September 4th was not his first warning to Japan. It was similar to earlier statements of April 17th and May 11th, expressing the concern of the United States regarding the maintenance of the status quo in the entire Pacific, particularly in the region of Indochina and the Dutch East Indies. But this latest reminder, coming less than 48 hours after the naval base deal with Britain, carried far greater emphasis. It carried greater emphasis because of Prime Minister Churchill's pledge never to surrender the British fleet and the resulting decision in Washington to keep the American Navy in the Pacific. Other developments have served to underscore the possibility of parallel action by the two English-speaking nations. On September 5th, the day after Mr. Hull's statement, Lord Halifax, the British Foreign Secretary, also declared that Britain had an interest in preserving the status quo in Asia. And on the same day, a conference was held at the State Department between Secretary Hull, Lord Lothian, the British ambassador, and Richard G. Casey, the Australian minister to Washington, suggesting the possibility of cooperative measures by these three powers in the Far East. Now it remains to be seen whether these diplomatic maneuvers actually foreshadow an extension of military conversations to the Far East. At the moment, there is no tangible evidence of any such staff consultations, similar to those being carried on by the Canadian-American Board for Defense of the Northern Half of the Western Hemisphere. But in terms of the Pacific, the important thing to keep in mind is that concerted action is always possible without any formal agreement, as long as the American fleet is free to remain in the Pacific Ocean. This is the real key to the strategy which is now made possible by the naval base accord and parallel action by the two greatest sea powers. The construction of the new base does not imply the adoption of a passive defense or a hemisphere defense resulting on some mid-ocean Maginot line. On the contrary, it opens the door to an aggressive foreign policy founded on Mahan's doctrine of the offensive as the best possible defense. It may foreshadow, as some insist it does, an unofficial alliance with the British Empire committing the United States to any and all measures necessary for the common defense. Or it may lead to a bid for dominance by the United States, with Pax Britannica giving way to Pax Americana. The ultimate outcome depends on the Battle of Britain and the fate of the British fleet. But whatever the outcome, and despite the methods now employed by President Roosevelt to accomplish his ends, we have probably seen the abandonment of American neutrality and isolation. You have been listening to Mr. William T. Stone, Vice President and Washington Representative of the Foreign Policy Association. If you would like a free copy of this talk, send your request to the Foreign Policy Association, 22 East 38th Street, New York. The Foreign Policy Association is a nonpartisan organization open to all who are interested in American foreign policy. It offers accurate information on current world affairs. In the world of today, foreign affairs are your affairs. You are invited to tune in next Sunday to hear another speaker in the America Looks Abroad series. Don Fisher speaking. This is the National Broadcasting Company.